There has been so much smoke about the Chargers potentially landing Michigan head coach Jim Harbaugh, and the latest reports say a deal between the two sides is gaining steam. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Lockdown Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. We've been covering the Chargers together now for eight seasons, but this is our sixth year as the host of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys, as always, for making us your first listen today. And to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe or follow for free on the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel and listen wherever you get your podcast from. David, what do we got today? Well, Daniel, you know what they say, where there is smoke, there is fire, and the Chargers might get burned. Charger fans might get burned if Jim Harbaugh does not eventually find his it's way a lot of hype. the Chargers. A lot of hype. There it is. And so we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about should the Chargers trade up for Marvin Harrison Jr. And then we're going to finish things up with some game predictions for the last game of the 2023 season. Absolutely. I mean, obviously a game that if the Chargers win, it's not necessarily good for them long term. And now it feels like they have a much better chance to win this game. Will they hurt their draft position? Stick around and find out. But this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, who helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NFL. That's LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. David, every single day it feels like we come on here and there's new reports coming out about the Chargers and Jim Harbaugh. And, and early on, you know, you had to kind of temper your expectations and you still kind of have to do that but at the same time though it's like now there's so much right where you have jeremy fowler saying the possibility of the Chargers and michigan coach jim harbaugh being a fit has gained steam in league circles at the very least los angeles has interest and has done some preliminary homework there's also been reports that the two sides have already met and then you have people like jason like him for which i think you probably have to take that with a grain of salt because he's a little bit more volatile as far as nfl reporters go yeah. saying that ben johnson will have a lot of steam for this opening and him sharing an agent with staley wouldn't be an issue but harbaugh badly wants this job but so do a lot of people and david it's just there's so much about it right like there's so many reports about it where it feels like okay hey like this is a real thing this could be happening doesn't mean it will but it feels very real at the moment I mean, it's just too much. It's too many sources from too many different places to not make you feel like there is some legitimacy behind what these people are saying. So it, to me, it, it definitely is something that's very exciting. I mean, we've made no bones about the fact that Jim Harbaugh is our number one candidate, a guy that we feel like has the pedigree, has that, you know, uh, kind of track record of success everywhere. Yeah, that the he sex appeal, went. the flash, like you, you get all yeah. that stuff. Like. He, he, he's that he's that sexy, that sexy candidate. Right. And so. That's what you want to hear. You want to hear all of these things coming out about that potential marriage because we feel like that's the right man for the job. It does. And it feels like right now, like the only guy for the job, at least as far as getting the whole package, where you yeah. get someone that knows how to put together a staff, you get someone that brings you an identity, you get someone right that has a proven track record of doing it at multiple levels and i mean has a, an insanely good record as an nfl head coach like guys like this don't come around in many of the you know hiring cycles like you're yeah, usually, unicorns you're getting a first-time coordinator trying to make or you know first-time head coach that was a very hot coordinator or you're getting someone who had been a head coach in the past but things ended terribly for them and that's why they're available to come to you now right like right. you don't get the this is a once in a blue moon type of hire and like there's so many people talking about it. Like I didn't even talk about Stephen A. Smith is another one. You know what I mean? Connor Orr, one yeah, of the leaders. Colin Coward as well. Yeah. Colin Coward. I mean, just yeah. wrote for Sports Illustrated though about you know why it feels like the Chargers have to do this for their fans and make a big swing and show your fans that you care and like this is the opportunity to do all those things. Oh yeah. Yet as Chargers fans, as a scarred fan base, as a team that can't have nice things. It does feel like when you're getting, you know, carried away with something like this, knowing that it isn't 100 percent certainty at this point, knowing that they have to go through the interview process and multiple candidates and all of those things. It almost feels like there's too much hype because, David, the closer, the more you get on board on the Jim Harbaugh train, the more you're setting yourself up to get hurt down the road, potentially. 
Absolutely. I mean, we're all romanticizing about the about this p- potential hire uh, of Jim Harbaugh to the Chargers. And, you know, the Chargers organization has definitely put uh, all of their fans through a lot of turmoil throughout the years, gotten really close sometimes, put together some really talented teams and, you know, not been able to really put it all together. So and also just at a human level, you can't help but get excited but also understand that there's a chance that it may not happen. And so, yeah, we are definitely building ourselves up. We're all very excited about the prospects of this happening. But if it doesn't happen at this point, it feels like it would be crushing to everyone. It would be crushing. And it feels like the more this kind of thing gets built up, like the more pressure that's on the Chargers to make it happen. And I think it's kind of good because this is the thing is like, the Chargers have said all the right things throughout the process, right? They said, okay, well, hey, we're not meddlesome owners, right? Uh, I, we'll work in the day-to-day kind of thing, but, like, we hire good people and we let them work. Has that always been the case? I would say probably not, and maybe they're downplaying what their, you know, meddlesome levels are sure. a little bit. Sure. Are they willing to reimagine it as they put it, right, and do things a little bit differently? I hope so. Are they willing to, you know, spend the money it's going to take? That's going to be number one, right? They've yeah. said they're going to do it. And it feels like with all the reporting out there, people are buying into the fact that they're going to do it. And when you have the narrative that you were a cheap ownership group that doesn't like to spend on coaches, when you have other people around the league who kind of see them in the same light saying, hey, it does feel a little bit different this time, it does get your hopes up, right? But it's like them not doing it at this point, especially if you was to go to another NFL team, right? Seems like a colossal failure. And the other part of it is, is just when you have so much hype around this, you just have to wonder where are the sources coming from who does the reports benefit and things like that right because as yeah. michigan could you know be the plan all along for jim harbaugh and we'd never know right like Absolutely, and he could be right. doing and pushing all of the right buttons to drive up the price it's going to cost and not that you know winning a national championship potentially you'd think that the price is pretty much maxed out sure i do think legitimately though he has nfl interest all of those other things that were so speculative and, yeah. and whether the Chargers will do those things are so speculative and they're saying it and they have to prove it but there is one guy i know that would spend the money and that's why i want to talk about this because it does feel like it could be a two horse nfl race i still think it's michigan or the chargers but are the raiders a threat to make this happen because that would be the worst case scenario are the raiders a threat absolutely they're a threat and it's because their owner has already proven that that he has absolutely no problem overpaying coaches to come coach his football team he gave a hundred million dollars to john gruden he gave a massive contract to josh mcdaniels and over fired. 10 million a year yeah. for josh mcdaniels which that's crazy does everybody remember the first time he was a head coach yeah that was an unmitigated disaster guess what it was a disaster again with the raiders but my point is this the the, the owner doesn't care if yeah. he believes in that person he will bust out the checkbook he will sign that check and hand it out and he's done it multiple times so are they a threat absolutely they are a threat so if the spanos family wants to change the narrative if they want to change their image of being cheap owners then they need to go out there and put enough zeros on the check and hand it to jim harbaugh to get the deal done and if they do it then i feel like everybody out there is going to feel confident that they went for it whether it succeeds or not Yeah, the Raiders are a very, very real threat. And I think the other thing is, is getting humiliated by the Raiders is also worst case scenario, right? Just because if you lose to Mark Davis and that haircut because you're not willing to spend the money, like that's on you. And and it only looks bad on you. No one's going to get mad at the Panthers for not getting Jim Harbaugh if he signs with the Raiders, right? Yeah. The other thing about this is that a lot of the ties and the loose connections that people are making with Jim Harbaugh. Yeah are with the Raiders as much as they are with the Chargers, right? The big thing, Don Yee, who's now helping him work on the contract with Michigan, but also potentially an NFL contract. He's Tom Brady's longtime agent. And Tom Brady, as we know now, is part of the Raiders organization, right? Does he have a role with the Chargers? Yes. Does he have maybe a bigger role with the Raiders or at least a better relationship with Tom Brady and the Raiders? Absolutely, right? So it's like there's a lot of ties that kind of go both ways. We're hearing a lot about the Chargers, and I think a lot of that is because the Raiders still have their head coach and Antonio Pierce as an interim who seems like he'd be a decent option to keep around. Maybe I'm just thinking that because I'm a Chargers fan and I want them to stay out of the race. Because <laughs> this is the thing, David. If they get into a bidding war, if Dean Spanos gets into a bidding war with Mark Davis, who wins? Oh, Mark Davis is going to win. That, and I that's mean, the I thing. Everybody so everybody like, that. Exactly. And that's why they're absolutely a threat, and that's why the Chargers have to. If you're going to do one thing, 
do what you have to do to get this deal done and absolutely do not let him go to get the this Raiders. Right. But we have much more to get into because that big top pick the Chargers have, potentially sixth overall, potentially fourth, potentially eighth, that is going to be a big, a big thing in deciding you know who the next coach is going to be or at least a big chip, be a big feather in the cap for sure. But would they potentially be willing to move up to go get someone like a Marvin Harrison Jr. to pay her with Justin Herbert? We're going to talk about that coming up right after this. First, I need to tell you guys about LinkedIn jobs because when you're hiring for your small business, you want to have as many top tier candidates as possible to interview. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs because LinkedIn jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn jobs gets you the type of candidates that are like the Jim Harbaugh, right? Other kind of places like this, maybe you get a Mike McCoy, you know, maybe you get an Anthony Lynn. But with LinkedIn jobs, it's not just about how many people you can get. It's about the quality of of the candidate and that's why LinkedIn just isn't another job board. LinkedIn has a vast network of more than a billion professionals which makes it the best place to hire. LinkedIn knows that small businesses are wearing so many hats and might not have the time or resources to hire and that's why you guys need to check out LinkedIn jobs because you can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. I also need to tell you guys about logics because you know this show has a lot of in-depth analysis and takes but let me give you my hottest take of the day. The best lineup in LA right now, it's not the Dodgers. It's Logics and the auto lineup of auto loans that they have over there. They start off at the top of my favorites, the proven and dependable new and used vehicle loans. You can count on these guys to give you low rates and save you big time bucks. Next up, you have the exciting new rookie sensation in their electric vehicle loans with super low rates and flexible payment terms. Rounding out their lineup, they've got their auto refinancing loans and lease buyout loans with these guys. You could lower your monthly payments and get on the road to owning your car faster. Look, I know it's a hot take, but seriously, no one can beat the lineup at Logix. Visit your local Logix branch right here in LA and the surrounding area and let one of their amazing team members help you or just apply online in minutes at logixbanking.com forward slash car. That's L-O-G-I-X banking.com slash car. All right, David. Well, <laughs> what are the keys for success when you don't want to win, right? We talked about a lot of the young players we want to see have an impact over these last couple of games. But we wanted to open it up to you guys, too, and do some fan mail stuff, especially since we had the Quentin Jammer interview earlier this week, which you should go check out, especially if you haven't already. But we want to talk about what you guys want to talk about. And that's why we're doing a Chargers mailbag on a Friday, fan mail Friday a little bit here. And we have some really good questions, including this one from Fishy Geek, who asks, should the Chargers trade up to get Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors? Whatever it takes, even if it means giving up a mid-round pick along with it, since Mike Williams is most likely cut this offseason. So we had another question about, you know, potentially packaging one of the Chargers' highly paid players with uh, someone, you know, and a pick to go up and get a pick. Those are really, really hard to find comparisons for. It doesn't happen yeah. very often. I'll start with this. I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr., that one piques your interest. I think Malik Neighbors, you probably take him if he's there potentially. I don't know if I'm trading up to get him. I think the other thing is what the cost is going to be, right? Because it's not going to be a mid-round pick. <laughs> it's no. probably going to cost a lot more than that. But, David, when you have someone like a Marvin Harrison Jr., a truly kind of generational type of receiver, it makes it very interesting. And I think who is at the top of the draft and other wide receiver needy teams, because there's a lot of kind of uncertainty at the top of the draft right now, who are those guys going to take? But like, he, it, it's very tempting to go get someone like that to pair with Justin Herbert for the next five years. I mean, it absolutely is because, I mean, hey, we all love Keenan Allen, but Keenan Allen's 32 years old, and he's yeah. in year 11 of his NFL career. So his career, no matter how you look at it, is winding down. He probably has a couple more successful seasons left, but you have to start planning for the future. You need to yeah. get Justin Herbert another weapon, and you know it definitely would take a lot of capital to be able to get it done. I think you're probably looking at either trading with Arizona or New England. And according to like the the, the trade you know calculations, and the how draft they, trade chart, yeah, yeah it's like the, the draft Jimmy trade Johnson chart, card, yeah, yeah. With Arizona, it's going to be your first and probably a third round pick that it's going to take, and then with New England, it's probably a first and a second that it's that's what it's going to take. So. It's going to take a lot. and We have to see is, where the Chargers get to, too, right? Sure, like we of have course. We have to see right. what pick they have. That's, but, that's assuming that they're at pick six right now. So right. that's obviously that can change, wh whether they win or lose in a couple of different outcomes. But it's, it's going to take a lot to be able to make that move. Could it be worth it? I mean, absolutely it could be worth it. If Marvin Harrison Jr. is the type of transcendent talent that he appears to be 
from college and you pair that with the unreal arm talent of Justin Herbert, you could see some real fireworks and fireworks. I think we've all been expecting to see, but haven't seen up to this point. Yeah, I think the important thing about this conversation is you are talking about a, a wide receiver too, right? right? Which doesn't seem like an immediate need, but like we're probably two years away potentially from Josh Palmer and Keenan Allen not being on this team and Mike Williams won't be on this team next season. So like yeah. you're talking about two years away from having basically Quentin Johnson and Darius Davis is the only guys you have under contract potentially, right? So like right. It, it is a bigger need than I think most people look at the surface and see. But I think the thing is, is like, Marvin Harrison Jr. could go number two overall. Like it a QB be. frenzy yeah. could change things and, and teams trading up to go get their quarterback, and that's going to happen inevitably, as it always does. And there's a clear top two, and I think potentially three quarterbacks that could get taken before the Chargers end up picking if they stay at six, right? But like, yeah. look at it this way. The Bears gave up a second, a third, and a fourth round pick to move up one spot for Mitchell Trubisky. Like what you're talking about is not trading a first round pick and a, a second round pick or a third round pick, right? You're moving up from your first round pick right. to that pick for yeah. a third round pick for a right. second round pick, right? They moved up and not only did they give them the third overall pick that they had that season, they also gave up an additional second, third and fourth round pick to go up by one slot, even though they knew the 49ers were not going to take goodness. their quarterback. They weren't going to take Mitch Trubisky, obviously. Right. So right. like, Picks at the top of the draft cost a lot. If it wasn't yeah, mid-round pick, hey, if you could say a fourth-round pick for me to move from six to four to go get Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah, I'm doing that all day long. Every single day of Sunday. the week, right? Yeah. But, like, they have the leverage. Saying yeah. when you're picking up that high, and when it's, especially when it's – like, like the Cardinals could stick with Kyler Murray and take Marvin Harrison Jr. Of course, yeah. The Bears could stick with Justin Fields and, and take Marvin Harrison Jr., right? Like, yeah. There's a lot of teams up there that could potentially do it and that have quarterbacks potentially, but are those quarterbacks good enough to not trade out of those spots, right? or to take a new quarterback instead of that. But the Chargers already have general generational player on their roster, right? Justin Herbert is yeah. one of them. And some would argue maybe Cameron Dicker is the other one. At least a tier thing. So let's hear what he has for us this week. Hi, Dan. Hi, David. I love you, my boys. This is a tier. Okay, Dan, this question's for you, my baby. All right. First, did you watch that Michigan defense on Monday against Alabama? Yeah. That's what I want to see in L.A. Now to my question. We all love Kiko the Dicker. Okay, we all love him. Are you willing to put him in the class with Adam Vinatieri and Justin Tucker? Or does he have to win the Super Bowl? Let me get your answer, please. Remember, Vinatieri won five Super Bowl titles. All I got to say. I love to hear from you. Love you, my baby. Thank you. I'm so honored that I get the question asked to me this time and not David, because he always asks David. So thank you, Atir. I appreciate it. Uh, I don't know if it's not about Super Bowls to me, right? Like, it, it doesn't really come down to Super Bowls. I think the big thing with Cameron Dicker is, hey, Cameron Dicker has a better field goal percentage than both of those dudes do, right? His career field goal percentage is 94%. Justin it's Tucker disgusting. is the best ever at 90, right? And then yeah. Adam Vinatieri, surprisingly, is at 83% for his career, right? He had a long career and he was a little... 23 seasons. Yeah, and, and that's Jeez. the biggest thing. It's just the sheer volume of kicks, right? Yes. Like, he just doesn't have enough kicks to put himself in those conversations yet, right? And I think the other bigger thing, David, is how are you performing in the big moments? Because at one point, Nate Kading was the most accurate kicker in NFL history, right? And even the mere mention of his name makes Don't David roll his eyes, right? But Nate Kading was great. Until the moment was too big. And we saw yeah. Cameron Dicker miss a field goal in a playoff game, right? And, and if you want to be mentioned with those names that you're talking about there, those big moments, the game-winning kicks, the kicks in the playoffs are ultimately what's going to decide it. So I'm as sold as I could possibly be on Cameron Dicker right now. But that other stuff, we're just not going to know until it happens. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for me, he probably needs a decade's worth of kicks to be on the same list as those two guys. They've just done it for so, yeah, so Yeah, Vinatieri, long. I'd say, hey, if he's doing, if he's kicking at 94% five years into his career, you can start mentioning him with Justin Tucker, right? Yeah. Because it's like now, it's not a fluke. It's not a good right. season. Like, he's having two seasons, rookie year and sophomore year in the NFL, that are better than some of the best kickers have had in any one season. I mean, this is like the year of the kicker. The amount of kickers over 90% <laughs> this year is insane. It's crazy, but like, if yeah. he keeps it up in five years... Yeah, he enters that conversation. Maybe not with Adam Vinatieri, Justin Tucker, right. though. Like, yeah, you get into it when you get five full seasons of those. But, but I'm with you. He needs more game-winning kicks. He need, needs more big kicks and playoff moments. Like that is is what's going to separate those two. Is it's not all about kicking your you know field goals in the regular season. You got to do it when the game's on the line, when it counts the most. That is where you kind of earn your medal as a kicker in the NFL. In, in the Jaguars game, too, he was three for four, right? So it's not right. like he, you know, was just bad in that game. He missed one kick 
that, you know, potentially yeah, it wasn't you look Nate at the Kane finals. versus New York. Sure. And, and like in Cameron Dicker's career, there's only been a few opportunities. Uh, he had one for the Philadelphia Eagles and a couple for the Chargers where it's a late go ahead field goal game winning yeah. type of field goal. He's never missed in those right. situations. Right. He's been put under the spotlight. I mean, even back to college. Right. He had a, a game winning kick potentially for Texas versus Oklahoma, where I first heard of Dicker, the kicker. Right. Yep. Because a great call. Dicker, the kicker. You know, like, yeah, the, he was kind of made in those big moments. That's how he got on the radar. Oh, yeah. It feels like he has ice in his veins to me. I think he is a, a very calm and collected dude, and I think he makes he's going to make a lot of big kicks. So he can't be mentioned with those guys I'm yet. With you. But hey, he does that a few more seasons. You can start putting him in whatever conversations you want because he's been a little bit unprecedented in his first two seasons in the NFL, and really just not enough kicks because of Brandon Staley's crazy fourth down decisions to kind of put him up there with some of the best in the league as far as attempts goes. But we still have much more to get into including in the last seven getting to is this a retool in 2024 or is it a rebuild because those are two different things how do the chargers best navigate what their 2024 situation is and will the chargers find a way to screw it up in the last week of the season and find a way to win a game that nobody actually wants them to win we're going to get into that coming up right after this First, though, I need to tell you guys that this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing, right? And this is a big thing because especially early on in the year, everyone sets their resolutions, right? Like I work at a restaurant and a bar. Like everyone the first couple of weeks is good at not eating burgers. A couple more weeks passes by, you see people kind of guiltily eating burgers, right? Like that that's just kind of how it happens. Like I see it firsthand. But one of the big things about that is like you can put so much pressure on yourself to do something, especially with New Year's resolutions, that when you don't do it, right, and you, it breaks it and you, and you kind of lose your way a little bit, you can get really, really down on yourself. And it kind of has a negative effect on it, right? In therapy, what they will do is help you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. And that's my always my thing with BetterHelp is giving you the tools to be better yourself even when you're not in therapy, right? And with them, it's super easy, entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. So celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. All right, David, well, it's time to continue this fan mail Friday here, and I've kind of liked being able to get a little bit more fan questions in here on this Friday, especially because Keys for Success, even the Keys for Success Express, I mean, we've talked about a lot of the young players we want to see from, you know, and that's not going to change going into this final game. But I like getting into all of these, and I think we have some really, really good questions today that are worth exploring. But I do want to tell everyone first to make sure they're checking out the first ever 24-7 sports streaming channel. Locked on Sports Today is now 24-7 live on YouTube, so make sure you guys go subscribe to that because there's nothing quite like it. Getting locked on a 24-7 stream that has all of the local experts, and that's just there's no way for big national brands to cover things like Locked On does because they have a local expert in every single market. So make sure you guys are checking that out because it is a historic thing. But let's get into the next question here, David, from the Chargers mailbag. And this one is from Ed Helinski, who asks, with a new general manager and head coach coming in, might the Chargers retool by trading and shedding some of their current high price players? So we know they're going to. They have to, right? They're yeah. almost $40 million over the cap. So we know some guys are going to get cut. And I think the biggest thing here, David, is is it a retool or is it a rebuild, right? Because we know they're going to get rid of some guys, but how many? How far does it go? How much are they kind of clearing the deck for whoever comes in next? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you start with what they have to clear. And so they have to clear about $35 million is is pretty, pretty much right where they're at as far as being over the cap for 2024. So where can you do that? What's the easiest way? Well, it's your top four cap hit uh, contracts. And, of course, everybody knows who that is. That's Joey Bosa at $36.6 million, Khalil Mack at $38.5 million. Keenan Allen at $34.7 million and Mike Williams at $32.4 million as far as the cap hit. As far as trading, I don't know if I see that as much as I see just a straight out cut in an extension situation. I say that they'll probably extend Keenan Allen for a couple of years. I think that's how they'll manipulate that, that cap hit. I think, unfortunately, with Mike Williams just you know having a severe injury and then only having one more year on his contract, I think it's a, a pretty simple situation to cut him as much as I hate to say it because I like genuinely enjoy watching Mike Williams play football and he's made some really big catches for the Chargers. But at the end of the day, business is business. And I think just looking at Khalil Mack, 
I mean, he could retire. He could want to get traded. He could want to go finish his career with a team he feels like has a better chance of winning. And with Joey Bosa, that's just a contract that's really, really difficult to move. All, all of these guys have a you know base salary of $15 million or more. So it's just going to be difficult to move them as far as a trade. But I think we're looking at cut and extension situations to be able to help clear up this cap. And I think it's going to be a retool versus a rebuild. Yeah, I think they're very hard contracts to move. I, I think yeah. the general rule should be for them, hey, if you can move one of the guys you're already going to cut, absolutely you do that, right? Sure, you get yeah. any kind of draft capital back as possible. But like the other part of it is is you know who knows that you're also forty million dollars over the cap? The rest Everybody of the Everybody else. So yeah. you have not as much leverage because it's like, okay, well, why am I gonna trade for this dude if I can just let him get released? Because I know there's no way you're taking him, him on your roster, yeah. right? You yeah, got Khalil Mack. And the reason you bring up base salaries is because that's what the other team would take on, right? right? And for the Chargers, you don't save more by trading them. You basically, it's almost similar to just releasing them, right? You right. don't just get rid of all the money. It does save you, especially if you're going to release them anyways, but it's about the same as just releasing them. So right. I think those contracts are very hard to move. To me, what it comes down to a little bit more is just like, what you have to do to be successful next year, knowing that you're going to open up those holes, right? Is it's like you're going to have to have a really good draft in 2024 and oh, you're yeah. going to have to hit on a lot of value free agents, right? You, you have to find the value in free agency. You're not going to be able to spend big, but the picks that you bring in, the guys that you do know and can bring in, that's how you're going to have to do it. I think the other thing with someone like Jim Harbaugh in Michigan, right? Having a very good idea of who the best players are in college football because you're around yeah. them all the time can help with that right oh, but yeah. let's be honest you're probably going to open up holes at wide receiver at edge rusher at cornerback at safety at defensive tackle at tight end potentially at center not knowing yeah. what the hit what the future is going to be for Corey lindsley and i think the other thing too is just the coaches that you have can they develop the young guys you have david because the thing yeah. is is like the offensive line's pretty much in place right now we'll see it about center but you have all those guys locked up right now but it also still needs to be improved, right? So yeah. can you find a coach that can coach up that offensive line a little bit better? I think those things are just as important as like who you're cutting is Agreed. can you go find somebody else to get the most out of the talent you still have? I think that's an excellent point. And then I think that's that's one of the things that I feel like we haven't seen quite as much, um, you know, with Brandon Staley and, and his staff. I mean, there hasn't been a ton of development there. And I think that's something that a, a new coaching staff needs to come in and they, they need to improve upon that, especially with the cap constraints that they're going to be living under for at least the 2024 season. Yeah. And there's certain guys that feel like they developed. I know Chris Saiz ended up asking a question like, Hey, do you know, how much was the regression of Derwin James and Joey Bosa like connected to Staley? And it's like, yeah, some of that is because you had really it definitely good players feels like it, yeah. and you're hoping that Brandon Steele can take them to the next level and they never hit that, right? In some no. ways, they regressed. In some yeah. ways, guys like Kazir White had their best season ever and Drew Tranquil right. had their best season ever and so did Alohi Gilman. So we did right. see some development, right? It's just for this next upcoming era for the Chargers, you have to find someone that can do the most with the roster that you're going to have left over because even after you cut a couple of these big names, you're still going to have a lot of the same roster if you yeah. want it, right? So it's right. making those right decisions, finding the guys who can develop, the guys you still have, or at least get the most out of them, have a scheme that can get the most out of the players you have, putting them in the positions for success. Those things are so important. And then hitting on those draft picks is so important and also Massive. being able to find some value in free agency. Find the value there. You're not going to be able to get the big, but you can find value as we've seen. And those are oh, the yeah. moves that Tom Telesco was always praised for, right? And he also took heat for the bad ones as well. Kirk from Eagle, we're going to get to yours next week. Definitely JT and that. We have some questions we're not going to get to today, but we have some good questions for next week too. But it's the final game, David. Are the Chargers going to mess things up and lose to the Chiefs on Sunday to potentially put their draft pick in danger? How do you see this final game playing out? Chargers, Chiefs on Sunday. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, they'll probably, unfortunately, win this football game. And, <laughs> and, and I, I say that uh, just knowing that they're going up against a backup quarterback and, and they're going to be playing a bunch of guys that really haven't played any football for them at all this entire season. And at least the Chargers have been playing with their current core for the last couple of games. So uh, as much as I'd love to see them lose this game to get the best draft pick possible, I, I think they're probably going to charge her and, and win this football game and and uh, make it to where they have the eighth pick. But that's just what I see. It's interesting, you know, because I think it'll depend on who plays, right? Because like 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 uh, Chris Clark was talking about on the crossover yesterday, which is a good episode talking about the Chargers and how they can kind of bridge the gap in this bad down Chief season and all that. Yeah. 
will they let some of those guys try to go get some of those milestones, right? Because they have right. some guys who are on some milestone kind of numbers that's like, yeah. hey, maybe they play a first half, maybe they don't. I mean, Easton Stick could also, like we talked about last week, be without his top three receivers. The Chargers are without their quarterback. But the thing is, is guys like Khalil Mack are going to play. Guys like yeah. Derwin James are going to play. The Chargers' best players. Hopefully, we see Deion Henley, right? No, hopefully we see Jordan McFadden. I know he's been, yes. you know, Dan has been a full participant at practice this week. Which has been good Good to see. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, Zion Johnson still hasn't practiced yet, so I doubt he's going to play. But the Chargers are playing their stars, and it feels like the only people that aren't playing are the guys that are injured, and they're not going to push it, right? Like, I truly right. think that Keenan Allen and Joey Bosa both play in this game if it's important, right? I think they're yeah. making the right move to keep those guys off the field. There's I'm no point you. at this point. Right. Young players, it's a little bit different. Dayon, hopefully we see more of them this yes. week. Yes. The Chargers should be attacking youth with youth, and they're not going to fully do it. I wish they would, because then I think they'd probably lose, but at least we get to see a little bit of these guys. I think they're going to win, too, and I think they're going to mess it up. They could drop as low as the eighth pick in the draft, which isn't devastating, but could cost you a chance at one of those top elite playmakers at the top of the draft offensively. We'll see. But I have the Chargers winning 17-13. to 13. I think this is an incredibly ugly game. The Chiefs defense had been pretty good, had kind of trailed a little bit. They still have Steve Spagnuolo, and I think he's going to cause fits on the Chargers offensive line as far as their blitz protections and things like that. But I think the Chargers win 17-13. And we'll be back with you guys on Sunday, so make sure you're here for not only what happens in this game, but for what's next after this game ends and officially the next era of Chargers football begins. So make sure you guys are with us on Sunday to discuss that on the live show after the game by subscribing and following for free Unlocked on Chargers' YouTube channel and listening wherever you get your podcast from. You can also find the show every day on our social media. You can hit us up on Twitter at LockedOnLAC. You can hit us up on Instagram at Locked On Chargers and our Locked On Chargers Facebook page. You can also find me on Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogmeyer on Twitter at DroTalk SD. If you want to get your thoughts and opinions on the show like a tier, you can call into 323-524-7924 to Locked On Chargers voicemail as well. We love getting your guys' voicemails. Ask a 30-second question, you will likely get on the show. But that's going to do it. Make sure you guys are here for us on the post-game show after the game on Sunday afternoon. But until then, guys, take it easy and go Bolts.